Hey, what's up guys? It's Pedro here from NoobCoder.com. And in this tutorial, we are going to be talking about queues. A queue is a linear data structure that can be implemented using an array or a linked list. Within this video, we'll be going over how to implement a queue using an array. So to get started, a queue has two main methods, a method called NQ, which adds the data to the back of the queue and a DQ method, which removes and returns the data inserted at the front of the queue. This follows the principles of FIFO, which stands for first in, first out, meaning the data that was first inserted within the queue is the first to get removed. Because of these properties, an analogy often used when talking about a queue is a line at a grocery store. The person who is first in line is the person who is first served. So now let's go over our queue constructor. First thing we're going to need is a place to store our data for our queue. And as I said in the beginning of the video, we'll be using an array. Now what we need to do is keep track of two positions within our array. Since we add at the back of the queue and remove at the front of the queue, we'll go ahead and have our head index initialized to zero and we'll have our tail initialized to index zero as well. Our head index keeping track of the front of the queue and our tail index keeping track of the back of the queue. Last thing within our constructor, we'll go ahead and initialize size to zero, keeping track of the number of elements within our queue. Next, let's go over our NQ method. Our NQ method has one parameter of data, and this data is what we're gonna be inserting at the back of the queue. So right now, our tail should be at the index where we need to insert at, since we are always adding to the back of the queue. So we'll just go ahead and store the data at the position of our tail index. Next, we need to advance our tail index. So this will be the new position to insert at when we invoke our NQ method again. And finally, we'll go ahead and increment our size property since we successfully inserted the data at the back of the queue. So now let's go ahead and take a look at our NQ method in action. So let's say this is the queue we get after invoking our queue constructor. And I wanna go ahead and invoke our NQ method, passing in one as an argument. First, we store the data to the back of our queue. Next, we increment our tail index. This will give us the new end position to insert at. And finally, since we successfully added to the back of the queue, we'll go ahead and increment our size property. Giving another example, let's say I wanna end queue two now. First, we store the data at the back of the queue. We then go ahead and increment our tail index, giving us the new end position. And then finally, we can go ahead and increment our size property since we successfully added two to the back of our queue. Last example with our NQ method, NQing three onto the queue, add the data to the back of our queue. Then we go ahead and increment our tail index to get us the new last position. We finally go ahead and increment our size property since we successfully added to our queue. Now from here, Let's go on to our DQ method. Our DQ method has no parameters and removes and returns the data from the front of the queue. First, we need to check if our queue is empty. So we'll go ahead and see if size is equal to zero. If it is, we'll go ahead and return null. If our queue is not empty, then we'll go ahead and save the data at the front of the queue before we remove it. So we'll save what's at the head. Now that we have the data that's saved at the front of the queue, it's time to remove it. We achieve this by advancing our head index to the next position. From here, we'll take care of some memory management. We'll check to see if the head index equals the tail index. That means we could reset our head and tail index to index zero. Now let's go ahead and decrement the size since we successfully removed the data from the front of the queue. Last step, let's go ahead and return the data. All right, so from here, let's go ahead with an example. So using the queue that we built with our NQ example, let's go ahead and invoke our DQ method. First, we check to see if the queue is empty. It's not, so we go ahead and save the data that's in front of our queue. After that, we'll remove the data by advancing our head to the next position. We'll then check to see if we can reset our queue to save some memory by checking to see if the head index is equal to the tail index. 
In this case, this fails. So let's go ahead and decrement the size. And finally, we'll go ahead and return the data from the front of the queue. Executing our DQ method once more. First, we check to see if the queue is empty or not. This fails. So we go ahead and store the data from the front of the queue. Once we have that, let's go ahead and remove the data from the front of the queue. After that, we'll check to see if we could save some memory by seeing if we need to reset our queue. This fails, so we go ahead and decrement the size. And finally, we'll go ahead and return the data. Last example, executing our DQ method once more. First, we check to see if our queue is empty. It's not, so we move on. We'll go ahead and store the data from the front of the queue. Afterwards, let's go ahead and remove this data from the front of the queue by incrementing the head index. Now, here comes the fun part. So here, you can see that we have wasted memory. Index 0, 1, and 2 are currently being wasted. So we'll check to see if the head and tail indices are equal. In this case, they are. So we could save some memory by resetting our head and tail indices to 0. Once that's out of the way, we can then go ahead and decrement our size property since we've removed the data. Last step, let's go ahead and return the data. From here, we'll talk about the downfall of implementing a queue like this. So given the following example, as our queue gets bigger, potentially we could be wasting more and more space as you see here. In order to combat this, we could implement a special kind of queue called a circular queue. So let's go ahead and convert our existing queue into a circular queue. So here's our original queue constructor and here's our circular queue constructor. The only difference between the two is that our circular queue must have a max capacity, meaning what is the max amount of elements we could store within this queue. We'll need this for our circular queue because of the way we'll calculate where our head and tail indices should be when we go to NQ or DQ. Next, since we're defining the capacity for our circular queue, we'll need a little helper method called isFull. isFull is a very simple method which has no parameters and just returns whether or not our circular queue is full or not. We can test this by seeing if the capacity is equal to the size. From here, let's take a look at our NQ method. So here's our old NQ method. And in order to calculate the next tail index, all we did was increment the tail index by one. Now let's take a look at our circular NQ method. There are two differences between the two methods. First difference between the two, since our circular queue has a max capacity, we must first check to see if we have enough room to insert. If we don't, we'll just go ahead and throw an error. Next difference is how we could go about calculating the next position for our tail index. We'll take the tail index plus one, modulus the capacity of our queue, and this will give us the next position to insert at. So giving the following circular queue, let's go ahead and invoke our NQ method. First step, we check to see if our queue has space or not. In this case, this fails, so we move on to storing the data within our tail index. We then go to calculate the next position to insert at. So our tail index is currently at four. Four plus one will give us five. So we get five modulus five. Five goes into five one time, and we get a remainder of zero. Now taking a look at the diagram, usually index zero would be lost, and this would be considered wasted memory. But because of the way we calculate our tail index, this is not the case anymore with our circular queue. Last step, we go ahead and increment the size. Executing our NQ method once more, first we check to see if we have space to insert at. This condition fails, so we could go ahead and store the data at our tail index. We then need to calculate the new tail index. So right now tail is equal to zero, so zero plus one, we get one. So we get one modulus five. Five goes into one zero times. So we get the remainder of one. Last step, we go ahead and increment the size. As you can see here, our size and capacity property are both equal to each other. So if we were to run our NQ method once more, our is full would evaluate to true, therefore throwing an error that our Q is full. So now let's move on to our DQ method for our circular queue. 
So here's our ODQ method. And all we did to calculate the new head index was incremented by one. You'll also notice that we test to C when we could reset our Q here. Taking a look at our circular Q's DQ method, it has two main differences. First difference is there's no need to reset our Q in order to save memory. So we won't have to test to see if our head index is equal to our tail index. And this is because our circular Q has a wraparound effect. So we'll use all the available memory without wasting it. Next difference is how we can calculate the new position of our head index, which provides this wraparound effect. First, we take the head index plus one, modulus the capacity, and this will give us the new front of the Q. All right, so using the example of the Q that we created earlier, let's go ahead and invoke our DQ method. First, we check to see if our circular Q is empty or not. This fails, so we go ahead and save the data at the front of the Q. We then go ahead and remove this data by advancing our head index. So right now our head index is equal to one. One plus one will give us two. So we get two modulus five. Five goes into two zero times. So we get the remainder of two. Next, we go ahead and decrement the size since we removed the data. Last step, let's go ahead and return the removed data. Giving one more example, executing our DQ method once more. Is our list empty? No, it's not. So we could go ahead and store the data at the front of our queue. Next, we could remove this data by advancing our head index to the next position. Right now, our head index is equal to two. Two plus one will give us three, so we get three modulus five. Five goes into three zero times, so we get a remainder of three. Next, we go ahead and decrement the size since we've removed this data. And finally, let's go ahead and return the removed data. So that is pretty much the ins and outs of cues. So I hope you guys learned something and I hope to see you guys in the next tutorial.